like to welcome everybody who's on. We are just about to get started here, give folks a few moments to get in, uh, get logged in and everything set up. And then we'll get started in <coughs> just a moment. Okay, well, we're at 12 o'clock, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, first, I'd like to welcome everybody to our uh, quarterly Dairy Sustainability Lunch and Learn. Um, as our previous ones, these sessions take place uh, once a quarter and are designed to give an overview of uh, the Dairy Strong Sustainability Alliance and then we also like to highlight a particular partner that we're working with or a project or a technology, something of that sort. Each webinar um, starts, as I said, with an overview and then we move to the partner. Um, a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. Um, first off, everybody is in listen only mode to cut down on background noise. We're gonna take questions at the end. Um, and if you would like to ask a question, there's on your go to webinar controls, there's a little uh, hand that you can raise your hand and um, it'll let us know on the, the control slide that you have a question to ask. You can also type a question into the screen at the bottom of your go to webinar controls. And um, I guess it's important to note that you can send that to the whole group or just the organizers. The webinar is being recorded and when, and will be available on the Dairy Strong website, which is dairystrong.org for viewing um, after the webinar. To start, um, I'm going to give you a quick overview of, of how this is going to go. So first, as I mentioned before, you're going to hear, so the, the total webinar is about 50 minutes-ish, and then we'll um, allow for questions at the end. We try to finish by one o'clock um, just because everybody has things that they need to go and do. Um, but you know, our, our presentations may run a little longer. So if, if you do need to drop off, that's fine. We're recording it. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to start with 20 minutes of overview on the DSSA side. We'll move to 30 minutes of our partner, ask questions at the end. Um, first, I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Maria Walt, and I'm the Director of Member Communications and Events for Dairy Business Association and Edge Dairy Farmer Cooperative. Um, I manage all of our member communications and events for both organizations, and uh, I'm involved with some of the farmer-led groups that we support through the DSSA, uh, which we'll be uh, talking about in detail later on. So next, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Lauren. Hello, everyone. I'm Lauren Bry, uh, now the Strategic um, Partnerships and Sustainability Director. So I'm responsible for guiding the Dairy Strong Sustainability Alliance, taking over for Maria, um, and guiding our involvement in sustainability projects in Wisconsin and the Midwest, as well as representing uh, Dairy Business Association, EDGE, and DSSA, in the National Dairy Sustainability Circles. And next, I'd like to hand it over to Paige Fracci, one of our partners at the Nature Conservancy. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, as Lauren said, my name is Paige Fracci. Uh, I am the Agriculture Strategy Manager for the Wisconsin Chapter of the Nature Conservancy, um, or TNC, as we refer to it sometimes. Um, one of our top priorities at the Nature Conservancy is providing food and water sustainably into the future. So um, that makes sense that we would be working with farmers and the dairy industry uh, here in Wisconsin. Um, that work is vital to our mission. So that's led us to partnering with DBA and EDGE um, to help form the Dairy Strong Sustainability Alliance, which you are hearing about today. Um, and my specific roles with this project involve helping um, with project development, providing some technical expertise, and assisting with data analysis and tracking with some of the farmer-led groups that um, Maria and Lauren have mentioned and that you'll hear about later on. 
So with that, um, I'm going to introduce both of our speakers on the nutrient side um, before we kind of dive into the DSSA. Uh, Steve, with us today is Steve Rowe. He's the president and CEO of Nutrient. Nutrient is a business collective of the leading U.S. dairy farmer cooperatives, including um, Dairy Management Inc. and the National Milk Producers Federation. Nutrient and its founding members are committed to helping dairy farmers reduce their environmental footprint and generate economic return for the valuable nutrients and other products they produce. <clears throat> Uh, Steve is joined by uh, Jamie Vandermolen. Uh, she's the Director of Communications for Nutrient. In this role, she works to communicate their message effectively, both internally and externally. She develops uh, a strategy and leads implementation of the exciting work that they're doing. Um, she works with uh, stakeholders like uh, DMI, which we mentioned before, and she also gets to work directly with dairy farmers, uh, lawmakers, technology vendors, uh, the list goes on. We're gonna come back to Steve and Jamie, uh, but first, like I said, we're gonna mention an overview of the work we're doing as part of the Dairy Strong Sustainability Alliance. Um, so first, let's start with asking ourselves, you know, why is dairy a good, um, a good fit for sustainability work? Um, our efforts with the DSSA are designed to support farmer-led solutions to today's environmental challenges. And, you know, on dairy farms, some of our biggest environmental impacts lie in soil and water quality. And um, the farmer-led projects we support are currently focused on nutrient management and soil loss. Um, you know, there's an opportunity for expansion into other areas that have impact, such as animal care. You know, we'll touch on that a little bit later, but we really feel like nutrient management um, and soil loss have a lot of potential in the dairy space. So that's why we feel like it's, you know, really relevant to start here. Um, <clears throat> let's talk about some opportunities in dairy. So we're fortunate to have, um, you know, respected metrics in place, both on the state and national level. Um, we'll touch on specifics in a minute, but you know that's a good thing. You know, we already have some of these metrics developed, and and also you know I alluded to this in the previous slide, but we have a deep understanding I think of our grand challenges, um, and some of these challenges are faced by the business and manufacturing community, and um, again as an opportunity. We have cost effective and proven practices that can lead to results like cover crops, buffer strips, low disturbance manure injection and more. And I would imagine that uh, Steve and Jamie are going to get into that a little bit through their presentation. But, you know, that's a huge opportunity. Um, we have some cost effective ways to really make an impact. Um, the public is also really interested in what we're doing. And I think instead of being intimidated by that, you know, we should really lean into that um, because this interest gives more accountability to farmers, which is actually a good thing because it can lead to um, funding and collaboration and, you know, just more projects that can help find solutions. You know, and ultimately I think none of this works unless it's profitable for farms. And so, I think our work is showing us that you can make an environmental impact and impact a farm's bottom line. And finally, you know, there's just a lot of opportunity for measurable improvement um, that can ultimately lead to, you know, positive stories that we can amplify to the public. A little bit of background about the DSSA. Um, we started, we started going three years ago. So August will be our third year uh, anniversary. And this effort has been driven primarily by the Dairy Business Association, Edge Dairy Farmer Cooperative, and the Nature Conservancy. Um, we have a whole host of, of partners, but really these three groups have been kind of involved in the day-to-day -day, um, uh, uh, day -day work of keeping it going. And um, as I mentioned, where we're having the most impact right now is supporting farmer-led solutions 
to environmental challenges and, and really taking into account the business viability um, and community engagement opportunities. So we, um, the way we do this we, uh, is providing support to groups of farmers that are, are springing up throughout Wisconsin. Um, we kind of just help, help make their initiatives go and give them ideas and support what they're doing. Um, we'll get into that in a second as well. <clears throat> you know, ultimately, you know, our, our, our end goal is to really take what we're doing at the farmer level and see it go across the supply chain. Um, but I think right now we're really, really focused on the farmer piece. These uh, eight, excuse me, 10 areas um, that you see on the screen are where we're looking to have an impact, big picture. Um, as I mentioned before, soil and water, um, those are kind of the areas that are bolded on the slide. Um, that's our major focus right now um, for the projects that we're working with. But um, the other areas are where we really want to go. And the interesting part, I suppose the fun part, is that they're all interwoven. So for example, um, there are positive economic and social impacts that go along with a nutrient management uh, centered project. So while the four that are bolded are our main focus right now, um, they apply sort of across, uh, across each of the 10 areas. This slide is about what we want to see out of this all. Um, we want to see outcomes in these, in these key areas. To summarize, our work is really about supporting farmers in tangible, data-driven projects that involve implementing new things, um, also making changes in some cases, and being proactive with what our communities and our customers expect from us. It's also a platform to showcase what the dairy community is doing in a voluntary way to impact, you know, real resource concerns of areas. I mentioned collaborators before. Um, this slide shows you kind of who's at the table. And none of this is possible without partnerships. Um, as I mentioned, the Nature Conservancy, DBA, and EDGE uh, have developed and are supporting the projects, uh, but all the partners on this slide are playing a role. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Paige to talk a little bit more about uh, our metrics. Yeah, thanks, Maria. Um, so we've also aligned ourselves with several national groups or organizations who have helped develop metrics and other tools to track and measure sustainability efforts sim similar to the ones that we are embarking on. Um, and it's important to note that we're not trying to recreate anything. Um, rather, we see ourselves as a sort of clearinghouse for some of these platforms um, that, it, that already exist um, at a national and local scale in some cases, um, and, and hope to bring these tools and programs directly to the farmers who they were developed for. Um, and we can provide some guidance on implementing these tools, um, connect farmers to, to individuals who can help um, implement these. It's, we, we really um, think that these tools are valuable and want to, to help them um, be used at a larger scale. So that's part of our goal and I think we all know uh, it's really important when embarking on an initiative like this that you have measurable results so that um, you can show people that you you really are your efforts are making a difference so we we hope to do that with by using some of the metrics that you see here on the screen um, uh, on this slide you'll see um, a few of those metrics are highlighted. SNAP Plus is Wisconsin's nutrient management planning software um, which is already widely used by farmers in the state um, and can be used to help track changes in um, things like phosphorus index, tolerable soil loss, those kinds of things. Um, 
the USDA completed a, the Conservation Effectiveness Assessment Project, or it's an ongoing project, um, and created some estimates for nutrient reduction based on different practices. So that's a tool that we've used to help make some estimates for some of the farmer groups uh, to show the impact that they're having. Um, the field print calculator through field to market, uh, the dairy, very important dairy crops of alfalfa and corn silage were recently added. So um, we're investigating ways to utilize this particular tool um, with some of the farmers that we work with. Um, and it, it's encompassing um, many different management practices in the field and giving an estimate of um, the the field print, uh, if you will, or the, the impact that a farm is having on things like energy use, greenhouse gas emissions, um, nutrient runoff, habitat quality. There's a whole suite of, of things. So it's a really cool um, metric that we're looking forward to diving into a little bit more. Um, the farm program um, through the National Milk Producers Federation um, is well known as an animal care metric and they've also added an environmental stewardship component so that's something else that we're um, we're looking at and that we're um, excited to see farmers using more so and there's and there's more to come I'm sure there's there's a lot happening in this metric space right now um, so we're we're learning right along with with everyone else in this as well So we're currently working with five regionally contacts, and there are also other areas of the state where we are talking with farmers who are interested in starting similar groups. You can see uh, the five that we are currently collaborating with on the screen. I want to emphasize that these are grassroots. So the DSSA is not calling the shots. These are farmer-led initiatives that the DSSA is enhancing with program coordination, technical expertise, and in some cases, funding. So with this background, I'd like to talk a little bit about what's working in some areas where we're uh, exploring how to improve. So the areas that are working well, in just three years, the DSSA family includes those multiple projects that I mentioned, encompassing significant acres and cow numbers. And these are tangible data-driven projects. This is also a scalable model, and we've had interest from state, national, and even international farm and environmental groups. As I mentioned, DSSA provides project support through assisting with back office administration, including communication, event planning, and more. And we provide guidance on projects, data collection, and analysis. And we're connecting the groups with technical experts like Paige. Finally, we support them in securing funds for the groups so they can implement their projects. Areas we're currently exploring on how to improve, um, one of these include data collection. Some of our groups are using paid consultants, some use local certified crop advisors, and some are relying on our help. So we need to figure out what's the best and most consistent way for these groups to collect data and analyze it, and then make sure that's implemented. The other area would be funding. So right now, this effort primarily relies on our donated staff time from Dairy Business Association, Edge Dairy Farmer Cooperative, and the Nature Conservancy. So we're continuing to seek additional sustainable funding sources so we can keep working with our current farmer-led groups, expand on those projects, and also get more experts involved. Next, similar to metrics involves annual reporting. So because each project and group of farmers is unique, and in some cases they're using different metrics, we are working on determining the best way to combine and communicate results from all of the projects we support so we can tell the broader story. So what do we see for the future? Well, we're working on scaling this effort. We'd love to see 10, 15, 20 or more projects, not only in Wisconsin, but across the Midwest or the country. But in order to do this, we do need to see more investment and involvement from a variety of stakeholders, including processors and brands at some point. So the bigger goal is that this would become a supply chain effort. Someday we hope these projects that we're supporting at the farm level will include key processors, brands, and even retailers that could show improvements along the entire dairy supply chain. 
but it does all start at the farm and helping farmers try new things, use those available tools we mentioned, and connecting them with experts to guide their journey. And this is where our main focus remains. Ultimately, we believe that innovation starting at the farm level is going to lead to a more sustainable dairy community. So now that you have some background on what the Dairy Strong Sustainability Alliance is up to, I'm going to turn it over to Steve and Jamie from Nutrient. All right, thank you very much. And Steve and I are both very excited to be here with you today and share some of the work that we're doing in Wisconsin. And a big thank you to DSSA for hosting us and been a great partner in this effort. Um, I'm gonna kick it off and, and Steve may jump in throughout. And then I just wanted to let you know, we are gonna save some time at the end to answer any questions you may have. So I think you can type those right into the chat box. So like I said, Nutrient has been, you know, digging into some of this work around water quality and water quality solutions in Wisconsin for a few years now. Uh, and, and we're here today just to share a creative approach uh, that we've been working on in Wisconsin that hopefully will change the landscape and deliver, you know, environmental benefits in, in a new way. So I know many of you on the line are involved in projects and, you know, we just were talking about some of the projects that are going on to advance water quality solutions. We hope that this will give you a glimpse of just one creative solution that, that we've been working on, and hopefully down the road we'll continue to have these conversations with those on the line. Um, hopefully this is just the start and we look forward to more work together. So with that, I would like to start with giving you a little bit of information about Nutrient and our background before we dive into some of the work happening. Nutrient uh, represents nearly all U.S. dairy farmers, and like Maria said earlier, we're focused on reducing the environmental footprint of dairy and making it economically viable to do so. This is our mission, and you know, if you read over the sentence, the first half, you know, we think we can accomplish and do. It's reducing the environmental footprint of dairy. Uh, so if we can do this, why aren't we doing this already? And it's really that second half of the sentence that we're focused on how can we make it more economically viable to do so uh, for dairy and agriculture. It, you know, many of you know on the line that, that farms have little control locally of their milk pricing and making the economics work is really crucial to advancing the sustainable efforts and our mission as Nutrient. Give you a, a quick slide that shows, you know, who we represent. We're represented by dairy cooperatives and companies across the nation. So about five years ago, uh, we, we started with a small handful of leading dairy cooperatives, which you see on the screen, and some organizations. And uh, this group came together with one shared idea, and that was manure has the potential to be a valuable product and, and not necessarily a, a continued problem. So um, we're a company that that's created and, and represents dairy farmers and any benefits or, or work that we, we do goes directly back to the dairy farmer, whether that's through access to technologies, manure-based products, uh, or increased technology incentives for, for farms. Just to give you a little bit of history, a Nutrient's original vision was really to accelerate uh, the spread of, of digesters across the country. So we looked at how can we scale digesters and take advantage of some of the energy prices. And this was um, a few years back. And, and some of you may remember or know at the time digesters we're the primary environmental and economic effort being pursued by the industry. And as we started to explore that option and the feasibility of, of making that happen, during that time, the value of energy dropped. And it, we, for the first time, kind of saw and realized that clear economic gap that existed for farms to you know, scale and adapt technologies that are available to them. So, while some of those opportunities, like the digesters, may have gone away, we still saw that there was a, a huge opportunity for dairy to be an environmental solution. But we needed to change the, the dialogue and get a little creative. So if we look over at these slides, you know, where are we today? Currently, we see increased regulatory pressures on farms, and we've all read about it. We've seen the headlines about stories of, of nitrates coming off the farm and into drinking water manure runoff and in increased regulations on farms. So how can we change this dialogue? And instead of continued increased regulation on farms, why not consider you know, a more creative, positive approach um, in looking at incentives for environmental improvements? We know that farms can do so much more beyond just making milk. 
but they can't necessarily internalize the sustainability advancements and costs. And, and they're really limited in what they're able to do and what, they're, what they can afford to do. So the idea of kind of regulating dairy more um, will not necessarily work and may continue to drive farms out of business. So we're looking at how can we create a future where we have more positive incentives uh, for environmental improvements that are coming off of farms. We'll talk a little bit more about this, but there are so many innovative technologies and practices that are available today. It's the economic gap that prevents large-scale adoption of these. And then third, there's increased consumer appreciation of food, and uh, it's gone way beyond, you know, is my food safe? Does it taste good? Is it affordable? Uh, now consumers are looking at what is the community impact, animal welfare? What is the impact of the food that I choose on the environment? And there's so many kind of different players competing in the space for that consumer plate. So we need to maintain consumer trust, trust in dairy and demonstrate how can dairy be part of the solution. And, and that's what we're really trying to get to because we see so many opportunities around that. So if you look at, I just wanted to go over, you know, what are we focused on today? There's three different areas that, that Nutrient works on. And the first is a technology catalog. And I encourage you all to check this out. It's on our website, nutrient.com. It's a free online tool. And it was created to help farms make decisions about manure management technologies. There are a lot of options and uh, it can be overwhelming. And we want to make sure farms have the, the right tools they need to make the, the best choices, the best business decisions for their farms. So what we've done is we've rated almost all the manure management technologies that are available today. And we've looked at, um, you know, from an economic standpoint, operational standpoint, and even an environmental impact uh, perspective. So, you know, what is this technology able to do from um, recovering phosphorus and nitrogen to reducing pathogens or greenhouse gases and, and odor? So we've really looked at it from a, in a really broad way and brought a team of experts together to do that. We kind of describe this as our uh, consumer reports for farms. So if your farms are looking for kind of a credible third-party information, this is definitely the place to go. I will tell you that it's not just a resource for farms. We find that a lot of people who come to visit and check it out are regulators, policymakers, and investors. And it's, it's important, and we think that's one of the reasons we have it open for the public, is we want to make sure that they can see what's available and why these technologies aren't being adopted at, at faster rates. So again, I encourage you to check this out. It's, it's open and on our site. The second thing we're looking at is advancing manure-based products. So after you know installing a technology, you can be left with this beautiful manure product that can be either used as you know, a high-efficiency fertilizer or potentially a soil amendment. And we think that's great if we're able to use these uh, products efficiently on the farm and then even find opportunities to transport them off the farm. Um, we see an opportunity to sell the products and maybe even help cover some of the, the initial costs of the technology adoption, but you're still left with, is that enough? So if, you know, you, you adapt a new technology and even if we, we have a product output, is that enough to cover the economics of this? And, and the answer is probably not. There's still an economic gap that exists. So this third category is what we're here to talk about today, and that's ecosystem services. How can we create markets around the many benef environmental benefits that farms provide. So again, dairy can be seen as a great solution. Just a, a quick belief statement to dive into this work. Our belief that is that the lowest cost voluntary environmental benefit or action should be economically incented by those who have the highest cost pollution prevention obligations. So how can we get what we all want, which is faster environmental results at a lower cost to all? And, you know, if you read this, we really think it's just because, you know, one party has the permit doesn't mean that that same party is the only one responsible for achieving the redu reduction. We believe there are many ways that we can all work together, and I think that's the, the sentiment of DSSA in general. So how can we better work together to find results? So even if you were to look at, you know, the Wisconsin River Basin, which this picture isn't necessarily the Wisconsin River Basin, it's Lake Champlain, but, you know, different watershed, same issue and challenge that we're looking at. You know, if this covers 15% of the state, 
cleaning the water in the Wisconsin River Basin is, is no small project. It's enormous, and, and we know that. And right now, it, for the most part, it requires local companies, municipalities, and taxpayers to invest in expensive infrastructure and work towards cleaner rivers and lakes. You know, with the approach that we're seeing and, and what this belief statement really is leading towards is let's look at how farms can help those in the community achieve the same limits and maybe better, but at a lower cost. And we believe, you know, when we say lower cost, that farms could potentially do it for 10% you know, of the cost. So our, our really theory here is that permit holders, uh, whether it be municipality, wastewater treatment plants, or paper mills, could buy those environmental benefits from a farmer, and it'd be a win-win to all. So if we if we take this approach and look at phosphorus reduction alone, the significant savings per pound of phosphorus reduced can be used to incent farmers and landowners to invest in some of those you know practices and technologies that we talked about upstream where it's less costly and, and definitely more efficient. And if you look at this from just a positive story to tell overall, you know, from a, my communication background, it doesn't really get much better. The entire community through this type of approach is working together for solutions. And we often say, and you'll hear Steve say it a lot, is it's really about re the rural and the urban communities towards a, a common solution. So we can come together both rural and urban and find these solutions for cleaner water. And it's really a great story to tell. And so this is the path that we're now exploring as a team. So there is a lot of conversation happening around ecosystem services today and kind of call it a, a hot topic. And if you've been in the space for a while, you may kind of be rolling your eyes because you know ecosystem services, uh, it's not necessarily a new thing to you. Um, but I can tell you, as we work in Wisconsin and other states, the conversation is definitely on the rise, and there are a lot of different ideas and beliefs about how this might work, how it should work, which services are most valuable. And so I just wanted to share this quickly um, to lay some groundwork and, and help us get on the same page about where we think this, the biggest opportunity today lies. So if you look at what, what type of programs exist and which ones are most likely to succeed, if you look over to the left, we have a list of ecosystem services. And you know, we, from renewable energy to air quality to greenhouse gas reduction, all of the things that we know that farms can help, you know, solutions and services that they can provide. If you look at the list at the very bottom, even for biodiversity, so this is something we often talk about, or the idea of butterfly fields. It, it seems like a, a great option, right? Everyone would love to drive through Wisconsin, through a sea of monarch butterflies. It's a nice image. But today, if we look at this, no one is really paying or obligated to pay for biodiversity services. Uh, so when it comes to building a market, there's no demand for this bottom of what we call biodiversity. If you look at the right column and say, okay, who would potentially pay for that? Can we build a market around something like this? It, it comes to the solution of maybe it's more of a nice to have. Um, is there anyone willing to pay for that right now? But if we look at you know, the second one down, water quality, which is what we're talking about today, there is a downstream permit holder who is already paying a lot of money to remove phosphorus from the water. So this seems like more of a, a viable market. Because the most important thing when having these conversations around ecosystem services is to look at, you know, who is going to pay? Um, is there someone who already has, we can say, pressure or requirements to reduce emissions, to clean water, to create healthy habitats? Um, so it needs to be more than just an interest in, in the service and it needs to create an actual market. So to the right, we have the potential buyers, both regulated and non-regulated. Um, and those regulated really have the most pressure to buy today. You know, our hope is that if we get some of these markets going, that potentially more interested buyers that we have listed below, such as corporate social responsibility goals, companies who hold these and, and need to meet certain goals that they've set, would potentially come to the table. But really today, we think the biggest opportunity for ecosystem services is on the water quality side with regulated buyers permit holders. So you could kind of draw a line to connect those two. And quickly, the good news is, you know, dairy stands ready and we have options. There are so many 
technologies and practices that are available today. Uh, these are just, if I went to our nutrients catalog and Googled phosphorus reduction and received dozens of options, and here are a few of them, and including uh, a practice or conservation buffer. So it's, it's not just about technologies, it's also about the practices and options that farms are able to provide today. So why are we here talking about this today and why all the heightened interest in this topic? We really see that there's the, the door is open today and there's a big window of opportunity. So EPA and USDA recently, toward the end um, of last year, released a joint statement. And that statement really encouraged states to consider what are some creative and collaborative solutions in water quality uh, that you can pursue. And then a subsequent statement, which was released just a few months ago in February, provided some additional guidelines from EPA on how to how to accomplish this. So this was big, exciting news from a national level. It didn't mean we necessarily were waiting for this news to come out, but it definitely helps the uh, helps advance the conversation. In fact, just this week at the Dairy Sustainability Forum in Chicago, we were on a or Steve sat on a panel with an EPA representative from Region Five who really emphasized that we can't get too creative with these programs and let's go to EPA and have a discussion about, you know, what kind of ideas do we have that, that can help advance this. So I think the story here is we can't get too creative, again, um, as long as we are still meeting environmental goals. And these market-based solutions or ecosystem services can help us get the economics right around the story. All right, so if we now if we talk specifically about Wisconsin, uh, many of you on this call probably already realize that this concept of, of buying clean water at a low cost is nothing new. And especially in Wisconsin, you've built some strong water quality programs to protect and enhance the state's water. Here are three of them on the slide right now. And to your advantage, you already have these, these programs in place. And now we're looking at how can we increase participation in these programs. We want to bring more um, players and projects to the table so that these water quality programs are, are taken and we can take the best advantage of these programs that are and what they have to offer. So how do we make this happen? Uh, if you look at this slide, we've kind of had a setup here of what we think, you know, how can we advance the increased participation in the programs and also advance this conversation in Wisconsin. So new proposed legislation has, we believe, the potential to really change the game around the participation in these programs. This legislation, um, Senate Bill 91, enables third party, a third-party clearinghouse, which you see in the middle of this slide, to facilitate the current water quality trading programs and provide just that extra element of certainty and accessibility for the farms, which you see over to the right, uh, industry, and the wastewater treatment plants. So an example, which you see over to the left, is the buyer. So this it's a pretty simple legislation, and we think it's going to bring huge results, uh, environmental solutions at a lower cost to all. So why a clearinghouse, though? Why can't we continue just to advance with the programs that we have? Again, just to reemphasize, it really helps bring together the buyers and the sellers. We know we know that these two different groups speak completely different languages. So how can we create a trusted kind of clearinghouse to bring these two together? And it also creates financial certainty to the seller and regulatory certainty to the buyer of those credits. For example, you know, I've heard from, from people on my team, some municipalities say, um, you know, I want to do something, I want to get a project started, but it's a little bit difficult to get a project to get together. So, you know, if the project were to default through this clearinghouse approach, um, or if we did not have this clearinghouse approach, they'd be left kind of holding holding the bag or, or left on the line. But this clearinghouse creates kind of a reserved pool of credits to guard against any defaults and it's just an extra layer of trust and credibility uh, to bring more players to this, this type of approach. So I won't get into too many details of uh, Senate Bill 91. But the legislation is moving forward and, and currently working its way through the legislative process. And a big thank you to many in the state, some of you who are on this call, like the Nature Conservancy, Clean Wisconsin, um, others who have helped move forward and shown support for this uh, Senate bill. 
And I'm actually going to, we have Karen Timberlake, who's on the line from Michael Best Strategy. I'll just turn it over to her if, if she has anything additional to say. They've been a great partner in this effort. Great, thanks, Jamie, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. We've been delighted to be a partner with Nutrient and with the DSSA and the DBA alike, along with the other groups that Jamie mentioned, in helping to develop some of the thinking around Senate Bill 91 and also moving it uh, forward through the legislative process. So I think the, maybe the only thing to underscore here would be we've had just great engagement and great collaboration by all the groups that you've been hearing about, as well as the state agencies that are currently responsible for both administering the current water quality programs that Jamie alluded to, and also groups like the governor's office and the State Department of Administration who would get the responsibility for actually um, building out and managing the clearinghouse. So we had a public hearing on the bill back in March, and uh, the bill was voted out of of its committee unanimously at the end of March um, in the Senate and is uh, in, on its way to being scheduled for a vote in the Wisconsin State Senate next week. And from there, uh, it will move over to the State Assembly and there'll be another public hearing. We'll kind of start that process all over. But good momentum, good engagement, good feedback, and people really see this as a way to add to, not replace, what's good about the current water quality programs in Wisconsin. So happy to answer questions when we get to that point. Thanks, Karen. All right, so as you can see, um, these creative solutions and this one in particular is not gonna move forward unless we have the support of everyone, everyone on this call and, and a lot of different players need to come to the table. So as we think about today, um, I would encourage you to think about what would your role be in a world where, you know, there potentially are more projects and, and ways to participate through this uh, market-based approach and, and the different programs that it could offer. I think I've covered most of you who are on the phone and within the stakeholder slide. Uh, just to go over, you know, what could your role be moving forward and, and encourage you to think about this yourself as well. But farmers, as we look to you, you can keep and keep going and employing smart, sustainable methods to demonstrate how you can be a solution and, and go above and beyond and provide these environmental solutions. Uh, NGOs, we encourage you to reach out and, and partner with groups like Nutrients and others who are building these market-based approaches and through this clearinghouse so we can add more credibility to the process in general. Uh, processors, we, we're gonna look to them and hopefully um, they will seek out environmental solutions from within their supply chain. So how could they potentially be a buyer within this marketplace that could come to be? Policymakers, uh, keep, in, keep your eye, or keep encouraging collaborative approaches like this one. If we look at investors, um, you know, keep looking ahead at the latest technology investments and market mechanisms that are available. And we could say the same thing for, for the innovators. And research and academia play a very important role in this as well uh, to help us close any research gaps that may exist today and ensure these programs are credible and also backed by, by solid research. So everyone has a role in this. As you can tell, we're really passionate and excited about moving this forward. And we encourage you to reach out if you to share ideas, um, ways that we can work together. I would kind of leave you with this, you know, if you were to take a few things from this webinar is that, you know, we can't get too creative with our water quality solutions today. And as long as, again, that we are still meeting environmental goals and we see this as one great way to do that. Um, and secondly, you know, market-based solutions are, are helping us get the economics right for the dairy industry. And, and third, reach out, consider your role in this and how you can engage and please visit our website. You can sign up for our newsletter to receive regular updates that we'll share on the status of how this is moving forward. And you can also feel free. We have our emails listed on this on the slide as well. So I encourage you to think through this and reach out. And that's it. Thank you so much for, for having us today. And I think if there are questions, you can type them into the chat. And also, I think Maria can take them through the phone. <laughs> All right, thanks, Jamie. Um, I'm just uh, getting our, uh, again, <clears throat> there's some slides, uh, excuse me, some contact information for all of our presenters. 
And um, so now we're to the question and answer portion. And you've got a couple also, options here. You can raise your hand or you can uh, type a question. And Steve, I'll, I'll turn it over to you as well if you had anything to add. Sure, thanks, Jamie. I just wanna share with the group before people take off and on their busy day. Uh, if there's a message to be taken away from the work that we're all doing, everyone on the call and Nutrient in particular, is we're pushing hard to make this a uh, entrepreneurial in its sense. There's a lot of things that the farmers uh, can do and we're saying let's try and convert this into a business rather than being responsive to some sort of regulatory or cultural or social pressure but let's let, make this a business off the farm where farmers see the economic advantage of delivering these benefits uh, to the community. And that's what we're working so hard to do. We've been talking about it for years, but Nutrients now in, in a position to actually advocate for that, make the changes that are necessary and push hard uh, to bring those technology investments into a real world of making money for farmers. That's uh, We're going to get a real win-win-win on on a true sustainability effort that accounts for the environment, the community, and the economics. Uh, so that's that's really the nutshell of what we're working on so hard. So again, I want to thank uh, BSSA and DBA and TNC in particular uh, for uh, giving us a chance to continue to share our message and continue to work together. It's been great. Thanks, Steve. Um, we do have a couple questions that have come in. Uh, the first one uh, says, which Wisconsin regulatory authorities will need to participate to make the creation of a viable ecosystems services market a reality? So great question. Um, uh, it, uh, we will, the way the legislation is set up is the clearinghouse, which will help facilitate the existing programs, has a sort of the business relationship is with the Department of Administration, and then the technical relationship with the DNR. And so because there's both a technical component and a contractual or business component to this, those are the two primary agencies. That 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 accurate, Karen? 100%. Steve has become an expert in Wisconsin state government over the last year or so. That's exactly right. And we have a follow-up to that as well, um, which is, will a farmer possibly be able to utilize a market contract as collateral for investments into manure technology on their farms? I love that question. You're thinking absolutely correctly. Um, yeah, the idea is if, if we're trying to build in real predictability in Wisconsin's programs by putting this clearinghouse in place, so that if you can say, yes, here's what we plan on doing, here's our investment, here's the return that it, it will generate through this clearinghouse, you should be able to take that to an investor or the bank, and that should be part of the, uh, the discussion on how to, to borrow against, uh, against that promise. It's, I, I really think it's the first time you're gonna be able to take what, what looks and smells and feels and acts like a contract to the bank and say, here's the income that I'll be able to generate from this investment. So that's our hope, absolutely. Uh, next question, and um, again, just for everybody on the phone, you can um, you can raise your hand in the GoToWebinar control panel, or you can type a question uh, to us and we'll moderate that. Uh, next question is, what is the likely timeline uh, of making this market a reality? All right, so I'm always hesitant to make predictions about um, things that rely on the political agenda, but I'm guardedly optimistic that there will be, there seems to be great support coming out of the Senate in very near term. And then Karen, you'll know the calendar, but we're, we're hopeful that this legislation on the clearinghouse will be completely supported by the legislature and the governor, and we have a surprisingly nice bipartisan support so far. You can hear how carefully I'm talking. Um, we 
are hopeful that this will all be in place this year. Um, that is a long, that is not a long shot, but that is a, a high bar in, in considering what's going on in the state and the changes and shifts in power. But we're, I'm truly guardedly optimistic and I don't think I'm overstating. Um, we have a real shot at having this in place this year. And then when you have to add on a few months of actually standing up the clearinghouse and getting the administrative work in place, um, I'd love to see something actually working up and running uh, a year from now. Great. Uh, let's see here. Okay, next question. Um, where can farmers get updates on the availability of this market? I mean, short of going to your website regularly, you know, what's the best way that a farmer can get an update on what's happening? What will happen is as each stage of the legislative process, we'll use DEA and EDGE and DSSA uh, to help get the message out. So I hope where you're normally getting your information on what's going on in the state, we'll, we'll try and feed into those. We won't, I don't want to force anybody here to, to find a new path. Of course, we'll do our own announcements along the way, but you already have a really good dairy community and, and we'll just share the information along along the way with them and DVA has been great and everybody has been. So I hope it'll come to you and you won't have to look for it. Right. Any other questions from anybody? All right. I guess a, a question that I have, uh, this is Maria, by the way, and um, we definitely, we did not prepare this one, so I hope I'm not putting anyone on the spot. But, you know, you heard a little overview of, of what we do in the DSSA, and sort of the farmer-led projects that we have going. Do you guys see a way that maybe a, uh, an already existing farmer-led conservation group could be like a really nice target for something like this. Yeah, let me ask, let me answer two questions. Um, one that I see that's up on the screen is, is does everything have to go through the clearinghouse? And, and the answer is no, we, we, we didn't, we purposely did not want to get in the way of any existing projects. What would be nice is if, is if this comes about the way we envision, you may find that working through the clearinghouse will make things easier and faster and more flexible and, uh, and I hope provide more value. And listen, uh, my vision for this is any organization that like the list you had up, uh, Yahara Pride, Discovery Farms, um, TNC, uh, that they, that it would become a natural thing in Wisconsin to come to the clearinghouse and say, here's a project we're thinking about and how do we set it up in a way that's going to take best advantage of the marketplace that the clearinghouse is going to help facilitate? I hope it becomes a great partner on every project, but there's no obligation to. So if there are private deals made on a one-to-one -one basis, a permit holder and a neighboring farm, there's no added burden or problem uh, in that regard either. Okay. Thanks. Um... I, I do want to remind everybody, this is, you may not hear it in the newspaper as it comes out because we've been trying to be quite gentle about this, but on this phone call, I want everyone to know this really is a dairy industry led effort. And yes, it's going to generate environmental benefit, but I really hope our goal is to generate economic benefit for the farmers who do those things that will help the environment. That's really ultimately the goal. And um, I got another question about, um, this is sort of directed at DBA and EDGE and, you know, how will we be spreading the word on a regular basis? So um, kind of to, to reiterate what, what Steve was saying, um, you know, we have our established communication channels uh, through DBA and EDGE uh, and through the DSSA as well. And so, you know, we'll continue to amplify um, opportunities coming through nutrient and and that's not I, I should say that's not unique 
to Nutrient. I mean, we feel really excited about what Nutrient is doing, but like one of the cool things about the DSSA is that any number of partners can join what we're doing. And, and part of why we exist is to spread, um, share with farmers programs that they can get involved with. So this opportunity, as well as a whole host of others, um, we have channels to get those directly to farmers. I would also offer, if I may, that if some of the groups, say either the co-ops or processors, um, who want to get even closer to what Nutrient is doing, get a hold of us. There are ways you can see our board is made up of of co-ops, and um, there is a uh, some interesting advantages in being directly part of that collaboration and decision making uh, on Nutrients Board or the advisory groups that we have set up. So if you're a particular co-op or processor or even as an individual farm want to get more involved, uh, let us know. The, the, doors, the doors open. Great. Uh, any other comments from any of our other presenters before we close for the day? Just to say thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, and, and thanks to everybody who joined us on uh, what is actually a sunny day for once in our office here. Um, so again, just want to thank everybody for joining. And um, there's a couple dates on the screen of future DSS, DSSA Lunch and Learns. Again, we hold them quarterly, so save the date for August 9th and November 8th. Uh, topics are forthcoming on those. But um, this has been recorded. We'll be amplifying that out through our channels and um, we will talk to everybody soon. Thanks so much for your attention. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you all.